welcome to Indian Time again. Uh, this month is uh, the month of uh, of uh, October. This is the time when a lot of people are getting ready to go hunting or are hunting. Uh, that's some of the things that were done a long time ago. Is, uh, uh, getting ready for the winter months would be out there hunting, getting the meat supply, uh, drying meat. Uh, the other thing that uh, we have today is the uh, place name of the of the show uh, will be Sintapke, Sintapke, which is Butte, what we call Butte today, and some people. Uh, there's a couple of ways that some people refer that to as a place of where um, people were was shooting fish in the head with bow and arrow. Uh, the other words we have this show, the animal for the show is el moto, el moto, which is the uh, domestic sheep. The plant for the show is Sa'atqulp, Sa'atqulp, which is the ponderosa pine. Uh, also, the ponderosa the pine is a, is a food in the springtime when the uh, people would peel some of the bark back and the cambium behind the bark was eaten for food. It was, it was very good, it's very tasty. We still do that today. The also this time of the year now nowadays today nowadays a lot of people are going out getting ready uh, cutting wood uh, getting uh, their supply of heating wood for for the winter so a lot of people use us uh, and other trees uh, to to heat their homes but a long time ago this was a time when people would uh, be busy hunting, getting their meat, uh, drying their meat, uh, and the winter and the snow was just right around the corner, so it was a busy time. It was time that uh, was not idle for, for people back then because survival depended on how much wood and how much uh, meat you got in for the winter. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, traditional wakes or wakes in general. But first of all, there's a couple of things that took place this uh, during this month uh, of October. On the 5th of October in 1854, the Jesuits established the Mission Church in St. Ignatius. On the 15th of October in 1932, it was the first Christmas tree business was established on the reservation at Dayton in 1932. On the 17th of October, 1855, the Salish, the Ponderé, and the Kootenai uh, leaders uh, signed the uh, Judith River Treaty. And that, that treaty uh, on the Judith River uh, was to divide the hunting buffalo grounds between the tribes and all, it was also a time to establish pe uh, peace with the Blackfeet and other tribes. So that was on the 17th of October, 1855, what is known as the Judith River Treaty. On, also on the 17th in 1891, Chief Charlot and 57 Salish arrived at the Jaco Agency after the forced removal from the Bitterroot Valley. On October the 18th, 1908, the Swan, what is known as the Swan Massacre, took place. And at that time, Camille Paul, Antoine Tsui, Padassi Tsui, and Martin Yellow Mountain were killed by a Montana game warden uh, whose name was uh, Charles Payton. Charles Payton, who was in, um, in turn killed by Clarice Paul to save the, the women from being shot. 
that was uh, we have a, we have a, a story we have a book coming out on the Swan Massacre itself. Uh, the time at that time when Clarice Paul uh, uh, was there and shot the game warden, she was pregnant, six months pregnant, at that time with her with her son uh, John Peter Paul, whom we lost uh, last year. On the 19th of October in 1887, 25 Lower Kalispell or Ponderay, under uh, uh, Chief Michelle. Uh, removed, uh, removed themselves from the uh, Flathead Reservation. On the 24th of this month, in 1901, Louise Combs was born. And so this year, on the 24th, she'll be celebrating her 101st birthday. So we wish uh, Louise Combs a happy birthday. Uh, Ahead of time, uh, hope she has a good, uh, a good birthday. Also coming up on the fourth uh, of October is the uh, quarterly uh, tribal quarterly meeting. So for those people that are interested in meetings, uh, the quarterly is uh, usually generally open to uh, to tribal members. It's, there's no agenda set for. Uh, the meeting. It's an open meeting for um, uh, tribal member concerns. Those are some of the, the things that I would like to share with you. Again, uh, the uh, month is uh, month of, of uh, October. is uh, The place name for this show is uh, which is Butte. The animal is a domestic sheep. And the plant is Saatqlp, which is ponderosa pine. Today, we, it's, a, it's a subject, I guess, that uh, we don't, uh, people don't like to talk about. But I think over the years, uh, I've been involved in, with the uh, early celebration. We have, uh, on the first day of the celebration, we have uh, what we call a memorial, uh, memorial day. Memorial time, the first uh, night of the Arlie celebration. At this time, uh, the memorial is uh, dedicated to those elders or to those tribal members who have passed on uh, the previous year. From and we go back and we we are we remember those uh, people that have passed on. But I think over the years, we, the tribe has probably averaged somewhere around 45 to 50 people uh, losing that many people annually. So that's, that's a lot of people. So today we want to talk a little bit about, about wakes. There seems to be some confusion uh, about wakes. What is wakes? Why are wakes held? Uh, what is a traditional wake? And, and today we want to talk a little bit about traditional wakes. Wakes. Uh, how wakes are traditionally held, what takes place, who's responsible for what. There, there seems to be a lot of confusion today on, um, on wakes and how things are to be, uh, how they take place and what, ta what goes on during the wake. Who's responsible for certain things. And, and I think uh, a lot of people don't understand, I guess, what traditional wake is, how a traditional wake uh, was held and what took place uh, many years ago. Today I have, uh, t with, uh, with me today on the show, uh, we have Pat Pierre from, uh, from the Dog Lake area. Uh, Pat Pierre is one of our, uh, our cultural consultants for the, for the Culture Committee and he's been part of the program for many years. And Pat's going to talk about traditional wakes. Uh, how he's seen traditional wakes, what has taken place during that time. And uh, as a culture committee, we have tried uh, many times to, to go back the traditional way to, to, to run things and to do things the way they used to be. But uh, uh, with the help of Pat and some of the elder elders, we're, we're learning and trying to do those things again. So today, uh, let's uh, uh, have Pat and uh, introduce Pat Pierre and let him talk about 
the traditional wake and, and how he sees the traditional wakes and, and what it means to him. Pat? Lemlemsh, that's the Yako Capes and Cuscali. May I have to see your own weather till it's because may I have to put it to the secret because it's a good spouse, me penun. I'd like to talk today, first of all, greetings to all of you. I'd like to talk today about traditional wakes. We have many wakes that are supposedly traditional, but they kind of lose, lose a mark somewhere. A long time ago, a wake started out <clears throat> The Indian word for wake is steam. They say we're going to have a wake like to me. And that word uh, kind of means like we're going to wait upon something. Like uh, a long time ago, before the deceased were embalmed, there was times when they the wake originally started out a three-day uh, thing. It was three days and three nights. And the reason for that is back before people were embalmed and before they were done like they are today, there was people that would, would uh, come back. They would revive within the three days. And that a long time ago, that's the way that the people done it. If they didn't come back after three days, then they would put them away. And so that's the reason that the word wake in Indian is chtim, like saying wait upon. So let that word come in there, chtim, we're going to wait upon him. And that kind of, a, it's not really, today it's different because the people, when they pass away, they pass on, they're embalmed, and they no longer have the blood that would give them life again. So, but we still have our wakes, uh, according to tradition. We still have our wakes at every death on the reservation. And a wake service, from what I learned a long time ago, is a very solemn time. You, it's a time where you have total respect and you don't uh, do any work out there, you don't do anything. The way it was in the beginning, you, at three days you laid aside everything, all your business, and you tended to the wake, and that was what was taking place. Uh, <clears throat> during the wake service, there was no activities going on out there that would distract from the wake. So it is very strict, and it was, like I said, kind of a solemn time where you, you put yourself into this wake and you, and you lay aside everything else. And during the wake service, uh, the young people, the children, had to pay strict attention to their parents, grandparents, or whoever, was in charge, and the young young children were not allowed to run in and out of the building. There was a certain time when everybody would go to relieve themselves, or whatever, and a certain time when everybody would go eat a meal. And other than that, there was no running in and out of the building, uh, which is happening today, and that's totally out of line. So when we took our children to the wake service, we made them sit down and behave and pay attention to what is going on. And so that, it was a very strict thing. Back in those days when I was growing up, if you got out of line during the wake, they either took you home and you had to stay home, sometimes by yourself, because your parents were at the wake. And that was discipline for misbehaving. We were disciplined very strictly. 
simply because we were told that we were supposed to be mindful of what we're doing and that we are to learn what we are doing. Learn from our parents and our grandparents. And this is a kind of a thing that, that, that always come forth and they told us that if we didn't mind, we'd be disciplined. So it is very strict. It is very strict. It was something that was, had to be done. And that's how I learned. And as we learned, I guess as we grow up, we, we teach our young people, our, our own children, that they're supposed to respect a wake. And the people that are there that bereaved the family of the deceased, they should have utter respect. We should not do anything to distract them from their grief and try to make things worse for them. So we work at it. And we, this is our place as parents of children to teach our children these traditional ways. That total respect is, is the most important part. And as we go, as we come up through the years, we see the changes that have taken place. A lot of these changes are not proper. When I was growing up, we had a leader. I grew up in the Camas Prairie area. Uh, in the Indian word, it's Kudlin E. She's in Kudlin E. I'm from Camas Prairie. We had a leader there, and our leader was very strict about these things because he was our elder and our leader. And he used to tell us about what we're supposed to be doing. And we had to do it. There was no other way around it. And during the wake service, it was a time to be quiet and a time to respect, show respect for everyone, not only for the bereaved, not only for the dead, but for everyone that was in the, in the building. And that respect is what we learned. We, we kind of live by that today. We still respect one another wherever we're at. And we learned those things early in life. But during the years, as the times seem to change, and we look at uh, different wakes, different funerals today, and we see these changes that take place. And these, some of the changes are not good. And simply, they're not good. And I guess the reason for that is Somewhere along the line, we forgot to, to train our young people to stick with the traditional ways of our people. Somewhere we, we lost track and we kind of let it go. And a lot of people today, when you, have, you go to a funeral or to a wake, you find that things are worked a little bit different. And that's according to the family's wishes. They say, well, we want it this way and we want it that way. And us elders, we kind of sit back and rather than to get up and say, you must do it the traditional way. You must follow what we learned back in the years gone by from our forefathers, from our grandparents and our parents. So we don't do that. We just kind of say, well, it's the family's wishes to do it this way. And later on, we kind of regret it because things kind of went wrong. And it's, it's pretty sad, you know. It's, it's hard to, to stand up and say, well, you can't do that. It's not, it's not traditional. You can't do that because it'd be wrong. Uh, we, we show that respect in that way that the family wants to do it a certain way. We say, well, I guess it's OK. And sometimes it's not OK. Sometimes it's against our traditional ways. But because of respect, we, we kind of let it go by, you know. So, well, yeah, we'll let it go this time, but next time we better, you know, get back on track. And the old timers, from as far back as I could remember, I'm 73 years old and I, I got a, a lot of road behind me, so. And one of the things that, that I remembered, and this old man that was a leader on the prairie, one of the things he used to say, your dead must not lead the living. And he, he explained that. He said, whenever you have a wake, you respect the dead, you pray for them, 
but you also pray for the people around you. But to the last day, on the third day, the leader would come and he would say, now, today, we put away our dead. So we must get ready to do that. So that there was this prayer that was said for that particular time. And I still remember a lot of these prayers that was said at certain times of the wake. <clears throat> We've kind of lost that today. We just come in and we do a lot of prayers. We sing a lot of songs. A lot of these songs are not in their proper place, but we sing them because we know them. They're easy to sing, so they come up and we sing them. But that's sometimes those songs are not in the right place. And so, but one of the things he said, that whenever you're taking the deceased to the cemetery or to the church, that the people must make the path for the deceased. The people must go first so they can make that pathway, they can walk that path for the deceased. The deceased will have a good path. And that is something I remember distinctly because we followed that very strictly. And the place that we had our wakes and services in Camas Prairie was probably 150 to 200 yards from the cemetery. So at the last viewing, and that was another thing that was taught to us, at the last viewing, when we go by and we view the deceased, we were required to step out the door. Whether it was storming out there, or whether it was raining or whatever, we had to go out the door. And we couldn't stay in the building. So whenever we paid our last respect, we went out the door and waited outside. And if there was 100 people, there was 100 people outside. But that was the way that it was done a long time ago. And that's the way I feel it should be done today to get things back where they should be. And I will explain that a little bit later. But at that time, after you paid your last respects, you went out the door. And after the last person went by the casket, went out the door, and then the leader would come and say, now, start. Go ahead and proceed to the cemetery. And the, the leaders out there would start their psalm. They'd do a little short prayer, then they'd do their song. And everybody sang the song as we marched to the cemetery. If there was deep snow, we walked the snow down, made that path. If there was no snow, we made the path. Nevertheless, because that's the way that we were taught. Always make a path for your deceased to the cemetery. That's the last resting place they'll be. So you people, you make that path. So after the last person viewed the, the deceased, then we'd start for the cemetery. And after we got moving, then, the, then they'd bring the casket, the deceased out, and they'd carry him. When we got to the cemetery, we walked in the gate and made a circle around the, the gravesite. And the ones that were still outside, they, they, they would make a path. They'd open a path. So they bring the deceased through this open pathway and put him on the gravesite. And then the people would form a circle, a solid circle around the gravesite, continuing in prayer. They would never stop praying. They would pray while the deceased is brought in and set on the gravesite. We'd close around, make a circle, a tight circle. And the prayer leaders would continue to pray. And then when it time to put, a, put the deceased in the ground, they would sing a song. And the song would go on while they're putting the person on. We still do that today, but we're picking a lot of different songs, and there was just one song for that particular time. And so when the, the grave was, the person was down in the grave, and said, all right, we'd, we'd We'd change our prayers, they'd start praying a different prayer, and they'd start burying the, the deceased. When the f grave was finished, that's when the prayers ended. But it was a continuous prayer from the time we left that building to the time the 
grave was completed. They never stopped and stopped praying. They just continued praying. And the one leader would stop, another one would take over. There was a continuous prayer. And after this burial, then they'd do one more prayer, and the leader would say, now we're true with our work here. We will go on our, go our separate ways. We didn't go back to the building and hold a dinner. We didn't go back and hold a, a giveaway. We left from the cemetery, went to our, our uh, means of traveling, and we left there. <clears throat> there was no, the, 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 the memorial service for each person at that time was one year from the date of the burial. The date of the burial, not the date of the death, but the date of the burial. One year, then they would come back and they'd have a feast, a gathering, and a giveaway, whatever needed to be done to finish that. And after that one year was completed, then they'd come back and they'd do the, the gathering, the feast, the, the dinner, and a giveaway. And that, that was the end of that. And that, that the way that they told us, <clears throat> The spirit is set free to be among the family. It does that during the wake service. We say, well, we don't want to bind that spirit down. We don't want to hold it back. We want to release it. And so, but this really didn't, which was not completed till one year after. After the feast and the giveaway, then it was completed. That spirit was free to move about. And these are the things that, that we are losing a lot of today. We, are, we have got to turn clear around. We have got the, the deceased leading the, the people. And I think this is probably why today we're having so many deaths, because we've turned this thing around. But again, I want to go back and I want to say this. The reason, I guess, that we're not we're not bringing it out and, and trying to make people go the other way is because of respect. We respect the people that are suffering the loss and we say, well, you go ahead and do it your way. And uh, so that's the reason that today uh, things are going wrong. And again, I want to say that maybe it's because we weren't strict enough in our teaching in my age, my generation, maybe we were too lax. Maybe we weren't, weren't saying, you've got to do it this way. This is the way our forefathers taught us. So you've got to do it this way. We're not doing that. We're, we're kind of lax. We're saying, well, they're the family. We'll do it the way they want to do it. <clears throat>